Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello and welcome to the Good News program today. My name is Greg Fritz and I'm glad that you've joined us today. We're going through the story of man's redemption, which is the greatest story ever told. We're taking our time with these programs and we're putting all the good news we can pack into 30 minutes and hope that, that there are plenty of you out there, and I believe there are, as we've begun to, to uh, increase our momentum that are enjoying these programs and getting a lot out of them. Uh, we have been studying on Jesus, our Savior, and there are study notes available that you can go to our website, download those for your own personal convenience and use. Um, I like to say we're doing the work for you. If you're a note taker, you don't have to take notes. We'll send them to you. You can find out where we've been and where we're going and follow along. Use them for your own personal uh, Bible study, Bible teaching. Uh, they'll just be something good to have in your resources. Also, if you haven't gotten my book, it's called Good News. And it is uh, really, I wrote this book to counter all the bad news that's out there in the world today. The Holy Spirit one day just shook me and said, you know, there is good news. You don't have to get consumed with bad news. There's a lot of good news that can be had. You just have to look for it. And so I wrote a book and called it Good News. And the tagline is, it's so good, the bad news doesn't matter. And that's absolutely true. The good news is not just better than the bad news. It's stronger, more powerful, and eventually it's going to overwhelm the bad news. It'll outlast the bad news. There's such good news in the Word of God to you as a Christian that we ought to be the happiest people in the world. We ought not worry and fret and be concerned about the future. And if you are, I, I contend that you've probably had too much bad news and not enough good news. And we're here to help reverse that trend. So get your Bible out and we'll jump right into the Word of God here and continue our study on Jesus our Savior. We're in Matthew chapter 16 and verse we're going to go down to verse 15 when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? That's a very important question because uh, the answer to that question determines more about your future than anything you'll ever do in your life. If you answer the question, who is Jesus correctly, it changes you for eternity. If you answer it incorrectly, it really doesn't matter what else you get right in life. You'll never recover. Because really Jesus, the person of Jesus, the importance of Jesus trumps everything else in the world. Politics, economies, world governments, uh, plans and dreams of men. None of it compares to the importance of Jesus, who He is and what He did. So we need to make sure we understand who He is get his identity correctly because not only have we received him, but it's our job to present him to the world accurately. There cannot be any neutral ground or compromise when it comes to Jesus. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. Peter answered the question, who do you say that I am by, by, with this answer? And it was correct. He said, <clears throat> You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's absolutely who He is. And I want to take some time today and talk about Jesus as Savior and Lord. And I'm going to combine those two uh, phrases together. We'll talk about Him as Savior and then as Lord uh, because these two titles are extremely important when it comes to us as human beings. We need a Savior and we need a Lord. We need someone to, to forgive us, to save us. And part of the problem uh, with people today is if they're comfortable, if they don't really have any pressing needs, they, they lose that sense that, that they even need a Savior. You know, if you look at a, at, a, at a beach, a public beach, the most unpopular people on the beach or the pool, around the pool are the lifeguards. They're the ones that are constantly whistling. And, you know, we, we go to uh, this health club where they have a pool, and every hour you have to get out of the pool so the lifeguards can have a break. And 
as far as I can tell, they're always on break, but whatever. Everybody gets out of the pool and you have to wait till the lifeguards are done and then you get back in the pool and, and nobody cares about the lifeguards until they're drowning. And all of a sudden, the lifeguards become very important. They become really desired. And, and, that, and that's true with humanity. When, when people feel comfortable, they don't feel the need, they don't feel the weight of their sin, they're really not open to the concept of a Savior. But the fact is, without Jesus, everyone is guilty. Everyone is a sinner. We need this Savior. And we need to realize that we need a Savior. And when people come to that realization, whether it's slowly or quickly, we need to make sure they know who the Savior is. There aren't many Saviors. There aren't multiple Saviors. There's only one, and His name is Jesus. Jesus said this in John 14, 6, and I'll, I'll read it to you. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, the truth of the matter is, if there's only one way, then there's only one way. I, I would love to be more acceptable and invite everybody's beliefs and and say you know they're all equal and everybody has everybody does have a right to believe what they want and everybody has a right to say what they want but to say that all roads lead to God is not true there's only one way and his name is Jesus there's only one truth and his name is Jesus there's only one way to God and his name is Jesus first uh, Timothy 2.5 said there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And if I didn't tell you that, I would be doing you a disservice because I know that it's true. Once you find the truth, you have a responsibility then to speak up. If there's a debate or people don't know or people are, are still in the dark, it's our job to tell them Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the way. All roads don't lead to God. God chose to save the world through Jesus Christ. He is the answer. If there's only one way, then there's only one way. And that's just the way it is. I, I, I really am not going to fight God about His answer. It's kind of rude. Uh, I'm just glad there is an answer. You know, there was a time when I didn't know if you could be saved. I didn't know if I could be saved. I wanted to be. I wanted to feel peace and forgiven. And I prayed and I searched and I wasn't sure. But when I found that there is a way, that there is an answer, His name is Jesus, I accepted Him. I, I was so thrilled that God provided an answer. Rather than fight against God's answer, people ought to embrace it. You know, it'd be difficult to live in a world where there was a problem but no answer, where there's sin but no forgiveness, where there's, you know, satanic dominion but no victory. That would be a terrible place to live. There is an answer, but it's not just whatever we want it to be. It's, it's specific. It's a person, and His name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. These are just absolute facts. They're truth that you can bank on, that you can preach, that you can believe in. They're truths that are absolute. They don't change with politics and they don't change over time. Jesus has always been God's answer. He's always been the Savior and He always will be. In Hebrews 2.9, I'm going to give you a couple more scriptures and then make a, another point. But he, in Hebrews 2.9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. You know, there is only one person that could taste death for everyone. Other than Jesus, we all had to taste death for ourselves. But He came to take our place. He came to pay our penalty. He came to pay our debt. And the Bible says He was, he was made a little lower than the angels so that He might taste death for everyone. Thank God He was willing to do that. I'm not going to fight against God's answer. I'm just going to thank God that there is an answer. And if that's Jesus, then so be it. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God that Jesus is the Savior. I need to be saved. I needed a Savior. And Jesus fully answered 
all of our, of our needs. He fully supplied all of our needs, spiritually, physically, mentally, and eternally. Jesus did it. And nothing's going to change that. In Revelation 1.5, we'll go there. It says, Revelation 1.5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. There have been many born from the dead since, but He was the firstborn from the dead. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Only the blood of Jesus could wash us from our sins. Natural human blood couldn't do it. The blood of animals couldn't do it. But Jesus' blood was divine. It was priceless. It, was, it had value. We're going to talk about <clears throat> the doctrine of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness in some upcoming episodes. I'm looking forward to that. But just know this, that because Jesus was the Son of God, He was sinless and spotless, and His blood was priceless. And it says here in Revelation 1.5, He loved us and He washed us from our sins in His own blood. Could you think about that? He died a horrible death so that we could be forgiven. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the King of kings. Jesus is the answer. And that needs to be preached and told and sung about as it is all over the world. You remember when Jesus was going into Jerusalem on that donkey and people were putting the palm branches on Palm Sunday. They were putting the palms before Him and they were praising Him. And some of the Jewish leaders said, Stop! They're praising you. And Jesus said, If they don't praise Me, the rocks would cry out. <laughs> that is an unusual being right there. Jesus is the center of, of all of creation. Everything that is made was made with Jesus in mind. He was always to be God's answer, God's Savior. I'm so glad that He answered that call, that He yielded to that calling, that He agreed to suffer in our place and to do what He did. Notice here in, in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 11, this is a, a, a sermon that Peter was preaching to the Sanhedrin when they were brought in for trial. And here's what he said in Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This is the stone which the builders, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is a mouthful. That is a powerful statement. And again, this, this tells us that all roads don't lead to God. There's only one way back to God, and it's Jesus. I don't think that can be said enough. We live in a society today that, that celebrates their tolerance, and really they're being intolerant, but whatever. They're always talking about tolerance, and they don't like this view that Jesus is the way. They want everybody's way to be equally valuable. And the truth is, it's just not. If there's only one way, then there's only one way. I, I say it this way, you know, when you get a universe and you get a creation, you can save it however you want. But this universe, like it or not, belongs to God. He, he, he dreamed of it, He created it, He produced it, and He saved it. These things are much bigger than we are. And if God Almighty created everything, gave breath, in our bodies and, and caused the, the sun to, to, you know, the, the moon and the, and, the, and the earth to revolve around the sun. And if He did all of that and He chose to save the world through Jesus, there's nothing that we're going to do to change it other than get with the program. Be thankful that He did save the world. Be thankful that there is a man named Jesus who came to die for our sins, but not fight against it. These truths are absolute. There are a lot of things, frankly, that aren't worth fighting for. They're not worth wasting your breath and your emotion on in this world. A lot of causes. But this one is. We should spend our lives being witnesses and examples and messengers with the message of Jesus and what He did and who He is. I'll tell you, every time I talk about Jesus, I feel like I haven't done Him justice. I haven't said all that should be said or could be said about Him. 
But I tell you, I love him and I, I, I worship him. I thank him. I honor him for what he's done. There's no way we could ever repay him for all that he's done for us. But we could be thankful. We can praise him. We cannot let the rocks cry out in our place and make sure that we give praise and honor and glory to Jesus. John the Baptist said this in John chapter 3. I think it's quite a, a statement. Let's just turn there. Uh, if you go to John chapter 3, and I want to... Uh, let, let's just start. We'll read verses 29 through 31. John chapter 3. He said something that I believe is incredibly uh, accurate. It pertains to us today. Verse 29 says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. What John is saying, <clears throat> John was a very popular minister in his own right, and he had a following. But once Jesus came along, people started to be attracted to Jesus. And people wondered, are you jealous? Don't, don't, do you care that everybody's following him? And he's saying, look, man, this isn't about me. This is about the bridegroom and the bride. I'm just announcing his coming. I'm like the best man. It's not about me. And, and so he rejoiced in the fact that the bridegroom showed up, that, that this is going to happen, that salvation is going to come to the world through Jesus. And he knew what his job was, and he, and he took it seriously. Man, there was no ego in John the Baptist. He was a humble servant of God, like all of us should be. But the statement that he makes next is the one that I wanted to get to because it's such an example for us today. I believe we owe this to the world. The world is in a critical place. It's polarized. Evil has gotten more pronounced, more bold, more in your face than ever before. Our society is coarse. It's, it's radical and it's going in the wrong direction. I believe that our society is so influenced by the forces of Antichrist and evil that, that you know, it's, it's becoming difficult just to do the right thing for the right reason. You get attacked if you don't agree with someone anymore. Forget what you do, it's what you think that they're after. They want to change your thoughts. Thought police, they want to make you think and talk the way they think you should. It's getting very, very intolerant. But we cannot uh, do the world a disservice and keep the, the message of Jesus quiet because it might offend someone. Jesus is too important. Here's what John said in verse 30. John said, He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. But he who comes from heaven is above all. Isn't that powerful? John said, he must increase and I must decrease. I believe the power that we're needing to, to impact our society, our world today, comes when we make that same determination that this is not about ego. It's not about building a kingdom for a man or a denomination. It's much bigger than partnership and offerings. Those things are necessary, but, but, but you know, it's a means to an end. What we're here to do is exalt Jesus. And if we could have the heart of John the Baptist and say, you know what, I, what my, my relation to the world, my followers, my influence is really not that important. What's important is that He increases. And I'm willing to decrease so that He can increase. It's a delicate balance. I've often thought that the work would go a lot better if Jesus had stayed here and done it himself. You know, he could have preached the truth a lot better than we can and been a much better representation of himself than we are, but he chose to leave us here. He gave us the privilege and the honor to present him to the world. He knew we wouldn't be perfect and he knew that we'd have our faults and failures, but the Holy Spirit's here to help us. But certain truths need to be impressed upon us. And this attitude of John the Baptist, I believe, is vital. He must increase, and we must decrease. We're not saying that other religions don't have a right to preach their message, and other people don't have a right to listen and believe that. I, I want everybody to be free. That's the way God made us. He gave us a free will so we could have 
choices. In fact, you know, the choice in the garden was either God or the tree. Today, there are so many choices people have that they can worship. They can decide to worship a hundred million gods or they can decide that there is no God. It's totally up to them. And they have a, a right to preach and teach whatever message they want and believe whatever they want. But what we must do is make sure that Jesus gets equal time. In other words, I don't want them to be quiet, but it's not fair for them to try to silence us. I remember the story that a pastor told John Osteen, who was Joel Osteen's dad. I used to get his cassette tapes back when cassette tapes were available. And I listened to him every month. And he told a story about get, going to a public building and there was an elevator. He went in the building. He was a pastor. He wasn't a very tall man. He was a kind of a short man, but he was big on the inside. He got on the elevator and, you know, an elevator ride's very short. And doesn't, you don't really have time to preach a sermon, but the people on the elevator around him were just cursing. And, and, you know, at Oklahoma and Texas, we call it cussing. And they were just cussing a blue streak. Right there in public, no explanation, just filthy, foul-mouthed. And Brother Osteen, he didn't, didn't like it, but he's not going to tell him to shut up. He just lifted both hands and he said, Praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Right in the elevator. He said, boy, that elevator got quiet. And those guys that had been cussing looked at him as if to say, what in the world is the meaning of this religious outburst right here in public? You know, it's funny. You know, people can cuss all they want in public, blaspheme and criticize and say whatever they want, and that's just their right to do so. But the minute you start praising Jesus, they want to know why. Give me an explanation for this. So Brother Osteen, he just looked back at him. In, on, the, on an elevator ride, you know, I guess less is more. And he just looked back at him and said, I just wanted to give Jesus equal time. Praise God, I love that attitude. We're not telling everybody in the world what to say. We're not forcing them to believe what we want them to believe. But I'll tell you one thing, we need to give Jesus equal time. There's nobody like Jesus. There's no message like our message. There's no gospel like our gospel. Jesus has no equals. He has no competition. And, and, and I say that with all humility, but there is no Savior. There's no Lord but Jesus. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. There is nobody like Jesus. You talk about heroes. He is the hero of heroes. He's the King of kings. He's done things for us that we could never do for ourselves. I say it like this. Nobody has done for you what Jesus has done. And if they could have, they probably wouldn't have. But Jesus said yes. He didn't have to, but He said, I'll go. I'll die for them. I'll give my blood for them. I'll lay it all on the line so I can redeem humanity back to God. And for that, He's the Savior. Brother, He deserves it. Jesus is Lord. The more I get to know Him, the more I study about Him, the more I see Him in the Scriptures, the more beautiful He becomes. I can say Jesus is Lord. He's seated on that throne. He's high and lifted up. He has the name above every name. And I'm glad He is. I've said this before, but Jesus is Lord and I'm not. And I'm so glad I'm not. Jesus is Lord and you're not. I'm glad you're not. But I'm glad He is. Nobody deserves it. Nobody fits the role better. Nobody could be more loving and beautiful and wonderful to the human race than Jesus has been. We'll never be able to thank Him enough for all that He's done. We'll never be able to repay Him, and that's not what He wants. But He did ask us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell the world who Jesus is and tell the world what Jesus has done. You know... It's a privilege and an honor, not a burden that we have. It would have been nice if we could have helped Him pay for sins or helped Him do something, but we couldn't add anything to what He did. But now we get the privilege of telling the story, preaching the message. The Bible says we've been made able ministers of reconciliation. We, we're, we're prepared for this. We've been born for this. We're anointed for this. Let's tell the world about Jesus. Let's do 
what John Osteen said. And let's just give Jesus equal time. You don't have to be uh, rude. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be hateful. He's not. But at least we can just give Him equal time. The world needs to know that there is a Savior and His name is Jesus. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to move to a new section in our next program. I, I, I'm excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you can make plans to be with us. We're making this program available on podcasts, on a YouTube channel. It's on gospeltruth.tv. I'm taking every available medium that I can, that I can afford at this point, and putting the word out, getting the good news out there. If this program's been a blessing to you, I invite you to come to our website. There are a lot of products that you may find helpful. We've designed them to help people grow and feed them spiritually. I believe anybody would be blessed by checking out our website. I've got articles and I've got some free downloads. And if you want to help us to continue this, you could buy some products or be a partner. We're believing God. I need another 80 partners at $50 a month to help pay for these programs. We've been using medium that's free. The time slots are free, but it costs money to produce the programs. And it's money that I didn't have budgeted in. This was kind of a shock, a surprise. About six months ago, we started to do this. And, and so uh, we were blessed, doing fine, but I just didn't have it in the budget to do these extra programs. And so we're believing God for partners like you, a good news army that would come together with us and help us. So if that's something you're interested in, please come to our website, visit us, and consider partnering with us for a year. It would really help us. If you could do $25 or $50 a month, it would mean, mean a tremendous, uh, um, uh, make a tremendous difference as we plan our year, as we budget for the, for the programs to come. That would do us a, a lot of good. So consider that. And uh, we've run out of time again for today. But uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next program. And until then, may God's best be yours. We want to thank the partners and friends of Greg Fritz Ministries. Your faithful financial support enables us to produce the Good News program and spread the gospel around the world. If you've been blessed by this program, we invite you to donate and partner with Greg Fritz Ministries. Visit our website, gregfritz.org, and become a partner today. Jesus used the Bible to prove who he was to the early church. These same truths can be used today to establish his identity beyond any doubt. Order your copy today of Jesus the Messiah, Visit our website to order at gregfritz.org. Want more good news? Visit our website anytime, gregfritz.org, for more teaching materials. That's gregfritz.org. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. He was also very, very harsh with the, with the hypocrites. He was not very kind to them in some of his messages. He, he called them scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, a brood of vipers. I mean, he was very, very direct because he, he hates religious hypocrisy. Isn't that great? You know, there's people that say, I want, I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, listen, Jesus is not a hypocrite and he hates hypocrisy. He hates religion because he came to love and to give and to help and to bless. Boy, you read the gospels and you just fall in love with God all over again.